Today, I'm going to take you on a journey, a journey to the past, to the present, and to the future. I'm going to show you how physicians throughout the world and throughout history have always tried to diagnose diseases. And in order to do this, they had to understand the complicated machine called the human body. As you may have expected, we're going to go back to ancient Egypt 4,600 years ago. Some of you in engineering may recognize the name Imhotep. Imhotep was not only the architect of the legendary step pyramid, but he was also a great physician. What you're looking at now is the Edwin Smith papyrus, which is believed to be authored by Imhotep. This is the very first medical textbook to ever introduce a rationale and a scientific approach to diagnose diseases and understand the human body. Before then, diseases were thought to be some mysterious form of witchcraft or magic. 3,000 years ago in ancient Babylonia, the chief scholar and physician, Isagil Kin Apley, have tried to understand the diagnostic of the body through authoring his own book, which he called the Diagnostic Handbook. He tried to understand the human body through developing his own algorithm of inspection. So he has introduced more than 3,000 entries to understand and examine the human body systematically from head to toe to diagnose diseases. 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, Hippocrates remains one of the most outstanding figures in the history of medicine. He is considered to be the father of medicine. He was the first to categorize diseases into acute or chronic and also into epidemic and endemic. He has introduced diagnostic signs for many diseases that we still use today, such as cyanotic heart disease and lung cancer. His contributions have allowed us to understand so much about the human body. Then 1,000 years ago, the Islamic scholar and scientist Ibn Sina, you may recognize him as Avicenna, that's actually his Latinized name. He's considered to be the father of modern medicine. He has studied medicine in great detail. He has authored more than 40 medical textbooks, one of which is called Qanun al-Tib, or the Canon of Medicine. This book is still being reprinted today in, in English as well, and he has pioneered the idea of using syndromes to diagnose diseases. His contribution has allowed us to understand so much more about the human body. Then in the 1900s, the Canadian physician, Sir William Osler, has reshaped the medical practice into what it is today. He was the first to introduce the fundamental of clinical and residence training in medicine. He's actually one of the founding professors of the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and influenced by Ibn Sina's work, he has authored his own book, The Principles and Practice of Medicine. This book has allowed us to learn so much about how we diagnose diseases the way we do today. So you may be asking yourself, why did I take you through this very condensed history of uh, the, his uh, the history of medicine? Well, understanding the history of medicine will allow us to understand our current medical landscape, and this will enable us to predict which new innovations are needed to launch us into a new era of medical care. So if someone goes to the hospital today, diagnosing a disease is conducted not only through clinical examination, but mainly through diagnostic approaches, such as imaging techniques, you get X-ray or CAT scan or MRI, or invasive blood work. Now, these tests are very helpful. However, each time you need to understand what is going on inside your body, you have to repeat the test. Every time you want to know how much glucose you have in your body, you have to stick your finger, get a drop of blood, and get a reading. And then you'll have to repeat that over and over. And this is the same for most other blood work. So what would it be like, or imagine if your body can actually monitor its own function, its own blood analytes, its own chemistries, and send these real time, continuously as they happen, to your smartphone, to your healthcare professional, to your pharmacy, or to the hospital. Imagine if we can do all this. Imagine if your body can diagnose its own diseases. What would it be like if we can do this? Well, this concept has been already introduced in many sci-fi movies, one of which is Mission Impossible. In Mission Impossible, they have shown this cool wristband that can tell you how much oxygen you have in your body without the need to do any uh, invasive tests. Well, I have some good news for you today. We have already started developing this technology here at Duke. 
So mission is no longer impossible. What you're looking at now is what we call a biosensing platform or a biosensor. This is a three millimeter long, half a millimeter thick implant made of a smart gel. You inject it once through a very small needle in the body and it can stay there forever. When it, once it gets in contact with the tissue, it's able to report back important body chemistry such as glucose, oxygen, carbon dioxide, lactic acid, and a whole array of analytes. It can do this non-invasively. So to obtain measurements from this, we don't even need to get in touch with the body. We, we can just read it wirelessly, and we can transmit these data anywhere, as I have mentioned before. I've mentioned, I said that they are made of smart gel. So we call it smart gel because it has the ability to integrate into your tissue without creating any foreign body reaction, which a term we refer to as biocompatible. And they have what we call a shape memory structure. That means if they get compressed or they get injected through a small needle, they're able to get back to the original shape that they were manufactured on. What I'm going to show you now is a video of pre-cut samples of these sensors that we have cut them into shapes like hearts and stars. And as we inject them through this very small needle, you can see that they're getting back to their original shape. This is the shape memory structure. So how does this technology work? Well, I'm going to show you an example we have already developed, which is oxygen sensing. So once these sensors are implanted, they're going to interact with local oxygenation. And they're going to fluoresce in a degree that will correlate with this oxygenation. So if you have low oxygen, they're going to fluoresce more. If you have high oxygen, they're going to fluoresce less. We actually are able to quantify this fluorescence and convert it into clinically relative values that we can use for measurements. And this is all done without even touching the body. These sensors, they do not expire. They always give you measurements. They can last there forever. So some people may not be comfortable with the idea of leaving these sensors in forever, right? And so we have developed new versions of the sensor that have predefined period of degradation. So you can basically, we can define if we want them to stay a few days, a few weeks, or a few months, after which they're just going to disintegrate and disappear. We have done extensive preclinical studies in uh, tissue models and in benchtop models, and we have obtained very encouraging results that now we're getting ready for the very first in human use and implantation. The technology is great not only for patients, but it can be used for soldiers, for example, in the battlefield. It can monitor the real-time body functions and important chemistries and send this back real-time to their units and alert them in case there is a medical emergency to go back to their unit for medical attention. It can be used also for athletes to optimize their performance and monitor their progress. So, 5,000 years ago, disease where diseases were thought to be some mysterious form of magic. If it wasn't for the tireless efforts of all these scientists, this probably would not have changed. Now we're speaking about a future where your body can monitor its own functions and potentially diagnose its own diseases too. Well, this is another form of magic. This is the magic of the future. Thank you.